So in this chapter, we're going to take a look at metamorphic rocks and see how they form, how they change, and the environments in which they form in. So first, let's determine what a metamorphic rock is. So a metamorphic rock is any rock that is pre-existing, which we also call that a protolith. So a protolith can be any rock. It could be a metamorphic rock, an igneous rock, or a sedimentary rock. But it's going to undergo alteration, usually through temperature and pressure, and that's going to change it into a new rock. However, it's really important to make sure you understand that metamorphism happens in the solid state. It's really easy to think about a rock changing if it melts and reforms. However, if a rock melts, we call that an igneous rock. So metamorphism is happening in the solid state. So we're going to see that the protoliths are going to undergo this solid state change in texture and mineralogy. So what that means is for texture, we might have minerals that grow to a new size. They might start out small and grow to larger. And mineralogy, meaning maybe we can recombine some of the elements that are there to make new minerals. It's basically the same as if you have ingredients in your pantry to make brownies, those are essentially the same ingredients to make cookies. You just use different amounts of them. We're going to see that the changes are going to be due to temperature changes and pressure changes. We're going to see that it doesn't have to be both. It can be more one than the other. And nine times out of ten, as you've learned so far, these changes are definitely happening due to tectonic stress. Um, plate tectonics is going to be the main cause for these temperature and pressure changes. But what is really important, um, since this is happening in the solid state, is that we have water in the system. And as water moves through the system, that's when it, what's going to help facilitate the mineral growth, that change in texture, and that change in mineralogy. So as I mentioned, metamorphism can result in a change in mineralogy. For example, we can start out here with red shale, which is mostly going to be a clay, okay, a fine-grained clay um, that forms at the bottom of a deep lake or the bottom of a, an ocean. And when it undergoes an immense amount of pressure, the different elements that are in here can recombine um, to make this rock over here that we call a gneiss. But these red little blobs that are in here, those are garnets. So we can basically take a mud and a clay put it under pressure, and it can form garnets. Okay, so that's what we mean by change in mineralogy. Here you can see there's a change in the texture. We start off with a rock that clearly has fossils in it, and as it undergoes a temperature change, you see that the minerals essentially regrow, okay, and you can see much larger crystals now. It looks nothing like the old rock, um, but it's the same minerals, just change in texture. Sometimes metamorphism can create what we call foliation. Your author in your book is also going to call this preferred orientation, and this has to deal with different stresses. So if we start off with this rock over here, this is a granite. Hopefully you recognize this rock by this point in the semester. You can see all the different minerals that are in there. If you take a look, you can see all the different mineral grains. And notice that they're all randomly oriented. However... If we put pressure on this rock, oops, what's going to happen is these minerals are going to get squashed, essentially. And that will allow them, you see here, to elongate and essentially line up perpendicular to the direction of force. That's what we call foliation or preferred orientation. Our minerals, minerals can also recrystallize, which means they're basically just changing shape, changing size, getting bigger. For an example, over here on the left, we have limestone, which is made up of the mineral calcite. But in limestone, there are microscopic okay, um, grains of calcite, really, really tiny. Uh, you'll learn more about that when we get into the sedimentary chapter. But when calcite essentially gets baked with temperature, it turns into marble, which marble is still also made of calcite. It's just these minerals are now much larger. You can see them. Uh, you'd be able to do the hydrochloric acid test on it, right? It would fizz with limestone, and it would still definitely fizz with marble. Some of our minerals can undergo what we call a phase change. Phase changes, you are 
you already know about, say if you go from ice to water, right, it's still H2O either way, just different forms of it, right, different chemical bonding structure. This is the same thing, and I apologize that there's not a picture of andalusite up here, but andalusite just kind of looks like this oblong column type mineral that's kind of brown, and as it undergoes a pressure change, the mineral, the chemical bond in there, will change into kyanite. It has the same chemical formula, just like ice and liquid water do. It's just changing into a different version, right? The chemical bonds have to rearrange in order to handle the stresses. We can also get neocrystallization, which is where we take old minerals, like we see here with shale, uh, shale right, clay and quartz, put it under pressure, and here you can see, right, that we've got new minerals like garnets here and mica grains in here. So we're basically recombining those minerals into a new assemblage. So we talked, I talked about a minute ago foliation, right, where our minerals start to line up with each other. There's two different ways that foliation can occur. The first is called pressure solution. So as I mentioned at the beginning, our minerals, are, in order for metamorphism to happen, there has to be water working through the system. Usually it could be in the form of steam, but we can have water working through the system. And we know the water is going to be hot because we're talking about a metamorphic rock. So here, let's say we start out with these nice round sand grains, and I've got hot water right, working through this system. Well, we know that hot water can dissolve things much better than cold water. So as this hot water works through, it's going to start to dissolve the sides of these grains. And so what it's going to look like right, is that these grains are now all elongated, like what we saw with foliation or that preferred orientation. However, this isn't due to squashing, right? This is due to the water dissolving the sides of the mineral. And we can tell this because if you look in the mineral grains here, you can see that they're still round, okay? So there's no, no squashing been done there. However, with plastic deformation, okay, this is what we saw before, this also can form that preferred orientation. So here we have these nice round grains, and they're going to get squashed, Okay, and you can see now that they're all elongated, but their axes are all in the same direction. Okay, again, showing you that direction of force happening perpendicular.